Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today we're beginning a brand new study, the study of the book of Acts. I'm real excited about this and I'm very happy to have with me today uh, Brother Bill and Brother Joe. Um, we're going to uh, start with Acts verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, and work our way through it verse by verse. Uh, first, we'll take a, a few minutes to give like an introductory overview of the book. But before we get started, uh, let me ask uh, uh, brothers uh, just to say hi to everybody. Uh, Brother Joe, why don't you go first? Yeah, hey, this is uh, Joe from the Sebastian Dresden channel, and uh, uh, looking forward to the study. Uh, it's the book of Acts. Uh, it's the fifth kind of historical book in the Bible. Uh, and, and on my Bible, I noticed it says it's the Acts of the Apostles. And uh, actually, there's only two that are focused on, Peter and Paul. But I think it would be better uh, named Acts of the Holy Spirit. It would be a more appropriate name for the book. But I'm uh, really looking forward to it. Back to you, Luke. All right. Thanks, Brother Joe. For immediately, you have to stir up a controversy. <laughs> Brother Bill, say hi. Hello, yep, yeah, and it's uh, me, uh, Bill Cuthbert, Iron Panda, yeah, and I'm looking forward to this study, yet. Yeah. as Brother, you know, Spencer just said, it is the historical book, you know, within within the New Testament, and, and there really is, and I assume we're going to find this out, that there's a lot of gems in that, I mean, a real lot of gems, you know, it's the birth of the church, and the birth of so many things, and, you know, looking forward to it, looking forward to it. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, if you're not already subscribed, uh, I hope you will subscribe to uh, their YouTube channels. Uh, our Brother Joe's channel is Sebastian Dresden, and uh, Brother Bill's channel is, I, I, I'm not sure, it's, it seems like changed the title recently. I think it's, uh, uh, well, Bill, what, why don't you tell them the exact name of it, because I don't remember now. Well, yes, now Bill Cuthbert, I'm Panda. All right, thanks. Bill Cuthbert, Iron Panda. And I hope that um, Bill and Joe both, you just, once the video is uploaded, you make a comment, and that way your, your, uh, your, the link to your channel will be available. They can just go look at your comment and then click on your link and go to your channel and subscribe. I, so please subscribe to both of their YouTube channels. Okay, let me, let me start first by just giving you my two cents on the book as a whole. Um, first of all, um, it's pretty much agreed upon that, that this is referred to as a transitional book. Um, transitional meaning that uh, you're going through a transitional period. Uh, from the very beginnings of the church, uh, over the first, uh, I would say, probably um, s several, several decades of the church, you have that church history. It's written, um, I believe it's written, um, let me see, I think... You know, the, 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 the historians and theologians don't necessarily agree about the, the dates of all the various books. But through my studies, I believe the first book that was, was penned was the book of James. It was written usually somewhere between 44 and 49 AD. Uh, and, and it's the earliest thing written so that we can get an, an understanding of how the church was, uh, saw themselves. Uh, in the very beginning, and then the, the very next book written was uh, uh, written about 49 to 50 A.D., and that's the book of Galatians. And I, I've, I've always seen the book of Galatians as Paul's answer to, to James and uh, his teachings. We'll go. Th I'm sure we'll get into that as we go along. But then around um, 62 A.D., uh, they say that the book of Acts was written. So. 62 A.D. from, say, 30 or 33 A.D. It's not agreed upon if Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was 30 or 33. Maybe you guys can give me your thoughts on that. But so you have about 30-year period there that uh, this book is, is covering the church history, the, f the first uh, few decades. Uh, it was written by um, Luke. Um, it's not really agreed upon what his status was, you know, as a, his humanity. Was, was he uh, born as a Jew, 
or, or was he a Gentile? Uh, it's, it's my contention that he was born as a Gentile but converted to Judaism uh, and then of course after that converted to Christianity. Uh, again, make notes on anything I'm saying if you think you want to uh, correct me on these things. But it was written by Luke and Luke uh, is, is looking back throughout history now, people credit Luke with being one of the great historians of the time. He was meticulous in, in writing down the record of these first 30 years of the church. Uh, the book of Acts also could be called Paul's Gospel uh, because um, um, Luke was a companion to Paul through much of Paul's ministry and so he got um, a first-hand account of all Paul's works and um, uh, just as uh, we know that Matthew the Gospel of Matthew was written as a first-hand eyewitness account by one of the original 12 apostles Matthew Mark was not a, an apostle but he was the companion uh, of, of uh, Peter so many people credit uh, Mark as Peter's gospel account. Um, Luke uh, was, uh, his gospel account is, uh, a lot of people consider that to be his, his uh, Paul's account of the gospel. And then John, of course, was one of the original 12 apostles. So uh, Luke wrote the book of, uh, Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And uh, so he, but uh, much of this he's written as from eyewitness accounts through him, his investigative work, uh, presenting it as a historian would, and also uh, the accounts that he got from, from Paul. Um, now a lot of people don't realize that this is actually an epistle. It's a letter written to an individual, and that might surprise people right off the bat. But this book basically, as, as Brother Joe said, is, uh, it says it's the, the Acts of the Apostles, but it really focuses on primarily on two apostles. The first half of the book is mostly about Peter, and the second half is mostly about Paul, even though m many other apostles are referred to. Uh, I guess that's enough uh, of a synopsis uh, on my part, but we can, uh, oh, the last thing I would say is that we're going to see a lot of um, uh, references to, um, you know, arguments that happened at the beginning of the church, and the reason we so call this a transitional book is because you, you can see how the doctrines and belief system of the, the church went through a transition uh, from think, believing that it's... Uh, in, Jesus came only for the Jews, and then they realized that he came for the Gentiles too. And believing that Judaism should continue to be practiced along with believing in Jesus, to finally concluding that they need to depart from Judaism and be a separate thing entirely. So this is the transition that the early church went through. Uh, all right, I think, of course, a lot more could be said, but I don't want to hog up all the time. Uh, let me ask... Uh, uh, who, do you guys have any preference on who you want to go first each time? I don't mind. I don't mind. I can go first now if you like. All right, go ahead, Brother Bill. Yeah, I just want to say the, the, the beauty of the book of Acts is it's organic, if that makes sense. It's living. You see the development, as you rightly say, at the church. You know, initially, the assumption was for the Jews only. Then, as we get around here you know, towards the middle of Acts, we see the Gentiles were coming forth, and you know, it's so organic, it's so living, and, and you know, throughout it, you can see the grace of God being understood more and more and more through that book. Even though it's historic, it is, you know, really, as Brother Dresden, you know, said earlier, you know, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, you know, because things are being revealed very clearly through that book. So, you know, I said, I'm really looking forward to this. All right, thank you, and uh, Brother Joe, your uh, intro marks about the book. Well, as I was uh, racing here from the Walmart parking lot to get to the bunker to, to join up, <clears throat> I was thinking, you know, this is uh, books. Of, book of Acts is kind of like a sequel. Uh, you've got the first uh, four books, the uh, 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all historical accounts. And, and it's like Luke does a part two. It's kind of like a, a sequel, uh, 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 a good sequel, not, not a bad sequel. It's one of the ones where the sequel is even better, as good as the, the original. Uh, it's like Weekend with Bernie's, you know, only, only uh, Christ is alive uh, in, in this sequel. And, and I think it's exciting, and uh, uh, it's action-packed, I think, and full of, uh, full of revealing of mysteries. So this is going to be a great study. Um, okay, good. We'll begin, but, but let me just ask: Is there is there anything in my my uh, summary or of the book that uh, you think is uh, I'm way off, or is, are we in consensus on those those main points or not? Well, oh, to be honest, I think you're totally correct. Not joking. Not joking. No, no, I think we are pretty much in consensus there. Yeah. Uh, I don't know enough to, to know if you're wrong, Luke. I just assume you're wrong. But we'll find that out as time goes by. Uh, very good. Okay, you assume I'm wrong. I may be proven right, but I may be proven wrong. We'll see. Uh, all right, I'm going to. Uh, I'm a KJV firstist. That's the title or description Brother Joe gave me. So I'm going to read first in the KJV, but I don't mind looking at other translations if they're, if they're going to be helpful. One translation I like to use is the Amplified because it, it amplifies it. It's not only a translation, but it's kind of like a, a commentary built into a translation. So, beginning, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Uh, let me stop there. That's just the first two verses. <clears throat> and uh, if it's okay, I'll just go in the same order each time, ask for Brother Bill's thoughts, then Joe's, and then, then I'll give my two cents. Brother Joe? Brother Bill? Well, no, it's an introduction there, right, right there. Uh, I can't really add much to that, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, just, I'll pass it over to uh, uh, Brother Sebastian, Joe. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a, a lot to say about that, I mean, it's a small section of uh, verses. I, I guess the only thing that pops out is that, uh, uh, that the Holy, Holy Spirit had uh, given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, so... Uh, I guess that the, the key points in that, that little bit of verse is uh, that the Holy Spirit had chosen the apostles; it wasn't they weren't chosen by man, and uh, and that He gave them uh, their commandments, which is uh, pretty mind-boggling. So back to you, Luke. Hmm. Well, I would, I would quickly add, if that's all right, the yeah, Theophilus, because there's always been debates who philosophy, you know, Theophilus was. But, you know, all, all I know for sure, you know, is his name means friend of God. So that, that's the only thing I can really bring to the table there. No one knows the person other than that. Um, okay. Uh, I'm glad you you, uh, you addressed the, this person of Theophilus. Uh, but I, I do think there are some important things in these first two verses that, first of all, uh, we can see right away that this is a letter. And I'm, I know that uh, for, for many years it never dawned on me that this is actually an epistle. Just as, uh, you know, uh, Paul wrote numerous letters uh, that we call epistles. Not to, not to be confused with apostles. Apostles are different than epistles. Epistle just means a letter. So Paul wrote numerous letters or epistles. Uh, we also have several epistles written by uh, Peter uh, and John. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if we could call Jude uh, an epistle. I, I'd have to look at that again. But uh, it was very common for letters to be written from apostles to churches. Uh, and this is one, another one of them. And so of all the epistles that people say, well, these are all the epistles. Well, the epistles didn't start with Romans. They started with Acts. The other thing is I'm not sure who Theophilus is. I don't know if he's mentioned anywhere else. But it is interesting to me when he talks about 
uh, how is it phrased? Uh, the former treatise have I made. Uh, the former treatise. Uh, could he be referencing about something else he wrote before? Could he be referencing the gospel account, uh, the gospel of Luke? Let me read this in the Amplified, these two verses, and see if they have any thoughts on it. The first account I made, Theophilus, was a continuous report about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he ascended to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given instruction to the apostles, special messengers whom he had chosen. Uh, all right, so there's... Uh, nothing really enlightening and they amplified okay before I go on any any other thoughts I'll give you another chance each of you to reply brother Bill not now I'm following continue All right. brother Joe? Uh, just just the fact that uh, that uh, the apostles were chosen by God and not by by men uh, I always wonder about the one guy that was chosen to replace uh, uh, Judas you know, a lot thing. So I think that uh, maybe you know that's an interesting point. And and was Paul the twelfth? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Brother Joe, you're jumping way ahead again. Uh, yeah, we we may be uh, we may reach that point today, but I don't know. We're going we're going to take our time and get through this. So I'm not sure we'll reach that point when they choose Matthias through drawing lots, but we'll see. Uh, all right, let me read a little bit off further. Verse three. Uh, well, I'll, I'll connect it to verse 2 until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God uh, Well, uh, I guess I'll read verse 4 since it's, it's, uh, it's not separated. It's just, he, Paul, uh, well, this is not Paul, but uh, Paul was known for writing long, run-on sentences, but uh, it seems like this might be, could it be in a period, but it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. All right, I should have really stopped. Let's just focus on verse 3 for a second, okay? Brother Bill? Yeah, yeah, and we know that, you know, that, you know, where it says there, you know, infallible proofs. We know that, that Christ was risen, you know, he presented himself to the apostles. Thomas, you know, stuck, <laughs> stuck his hand in his side, and that lot. And not only that, we had, you know, 500 witnesses to the resurrection. So, you know, there was plenty of infallible proofs that, that Christ had surely risen, you know, from the grave. So that's, that's what I'd glean straight out of that. All right, thanks. And Brother Joe? Yeah, I, 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 I agree with what, the, what the, uh, the Iron Panda had to say. Uh, slightly distracted. Here, Andrew, show yourself. This is my favorite nephew that we all did. I, I also have, I also have my, my daughter and my wife that just fled the room. So I got distracted. Uh, so in times of distraction, I defer back to Bill. Yes, I agree with what Bill said, and I'll be ready for the next set. Mm. Well, probably 99% of the time, you can just say I agree with Bill, and you're, it's a pretty safe bet. Of course, I haven't found anybody I agree with 100%, but in those areas where we disagree, perhaps I'm the one that's wrong. We'll see. Um, all right, the, I'm going to read verse 3 in the Amplified. To these men he also showed himself alive after his suffering in Gethsemane and on the cross by a series of many infallible proofs and unquestionable demonstrations appearing to them over a period of 40 days and talking to them about the things concerning the kingdom of God. Um, okay, the... Um, Oops. I 
I've always loved the, the use of the word infallible because when we look at uh, the modern translations, uh, I think many of them use the word convincing. And uh, in, infallible means it's, it's impossible to be wrong. And, and uh, uh, that, that's to me, it's, it's, this is, he's talking about many things, but primarily this is about his resurrection, his, uh, his appearing to, uh, in other places we see in, in 1 Corinthians 15, it, it explains that he appeared to over 500 people over that 40 day period. So he appeared to all these people, and I always say, uh, every gospel message I give, that he, 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 he showed himself to over a 40-day period, to over 500 people, and they saw him, they talked to him, they touched him, they ate with him. So this is, uh, he, he showed himself in a way that it's infallible. It could not be mistaken for anything else but a broadly resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians 15, we learn the importance of believing in the resurrection and, and uh, the importance of the fact that he, he did offer the resurrection as the proof that, that he is God and Savior. Uh, all right, before before I go to verse 4, anything else, Brother Bill? Well, I suppose uh, just to uh, you know, open the can of worms, is, you know, what, what I've always been interested in is you know where, where he says and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and I've always wanted to think what things specific things was he on about and that might seem a bit of an inane question but it'd be interesting what was going on through his head is, is he just speaking back of what obviously the apostles said to him in regard to Christ or, or, or anything else but that's that's my thoughts there mm -hmm. All right, uh, Joe. Not, not, not to just parrot Bill again, but that's exactly what I was thinking. You know, they said somewhere in the Bible that if all the things that Christ did and said were uh, all written down, that it would take a, a whole library to fill uh, all of the things. Well, for 40 days, he was revealing to them things about the kingdom of God that, uh, that aren't related. And so uh, that's fascinating to me. And uh, uh, that those 40 days, and, and, and it was infallible proofs after his passion. I like how they call it his passion, uh, laying down his life for the world. That Those things uh, jump out at me, too. All right, thanks. Let's uh, read verse 4 now again. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Uh, Brother Bill? Well, yeah, that one's basically relating, you know, back to what Christ said. You know, you know, when, when he, I can remember in the Apostles that, that he breathed on the Apostles and he told them basically, yeah, you know, wait in Jerusalem, because obviously there's going to come, you know, a, a real mighty wind. You know, uh, and, and obviously that the that the tongues are far and stuff. So they they knew pretty clearly they had to wait. You know, at Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, brother Joe. I'm going to go turn. Yeah, it's uh, it, it goes together with five uh, pretty much the next verse. Uh, I think it's fascinating that Christ had to be physically gone for the Holy Spirit to take his place or to uh, represent himself uh, in the believer. And, and there's something there, too, that's, that's kind of fascinating, you know, that literally Christ's physical presence had to be gone before the Holy Spirit would uh, take his place and, and teach further. So uh, I don't know why that is. I, I can't figure that out. But uh, it's probably something pretty heavy. I can't. I don't know what it is, though. All right. Um, the idea of him telling them to wait in Jerusalem. I think it, it, Bill is correct that they needed to wait in Jerusalem because, and to be gathered together, uh, waiting together, and they're waiting, of course, for the Holy Spirit. Um, but it's also important to understand that they're told to restrict themselves to Jerusalem for a while. Um, I think 
pretty soon, though, he, he they were told to go elsewhere to, you know, out of, outside of Jerusalem and maybe Samaria and then all over the world. Uh, but the beginnings of the church was in Jerusalem, and the beginnings of the church was uh, the gospel was preached first to the Jewish people exclusively. Um, Bill posted something here, John 10:22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Yeah, that's... Um, well, The um, if we go back to that reference in John, though, this is a, a filling of the Holy Ghost. And that's, of course, a di totally different thing than the uh, uh, baptism of the Holy Ghost, baptism of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I guess we'll draw that distinction more later. But let me read this in the Amplified, verse 4, and see if it has anything helpful. While being together and eating with them, uh, so, uh, you know, again, this is an example of Jesus eating with them. Didn't, why did he eat with them? Well, obviously, he, he didn't need to eat. He didn't have to eat in order to subsist, to, to live. Uh, uh, he ate as this is just one of the things he did to show that hey this is a real bodily resurrection I'm a complete person again I'm not just just a spirit he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem but to wait for what the father had promised and which uh, is the the Holy Spirit of which he said you have heard me speak so the father promised the Holy Spirit Jesus told them about it uh, in his incarnation and now he's reminding them of, of, of this all again okay I'm going to go back to the verse 5 in the KJV for John truly baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence brother Bill well yeah yeah very interesting we obviously know that that John's baptism you know was for the Jews basically it, it was symbolic. It wasn't a baptism that, that saves. You know that 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 you know that only comes from faith in Christ. But you know, I just love the way things tie in. You know, and because I know a little bit of strange Pentecostal teaching, and obviously know the truth as well. You know, ma many within Pentecostal circles would say that that no one actually got saved at all. Until the Holy Spirit came down, you know, Acts, you know, in the beginning of Acts. But obviously, we've just read John, you know, twenty twenty two, where he said, where well, he breathed on them and said, "Receive you the Holy Ghost." So they got saved that moment, and even you know, before that, you know, Jesus washed their feet and said, "You, ye are all clean, except for one, which you know was Judas." So this this Holy Spirit one mass pouring down at Pentecost, you know, has had to be. Suffering different. Just in, this is in my, my point of view. You know, I, I believe it wasn't. You know, uh, the people suddenly got saved because Holy Spirit wasn't around in two men, and, but it was more like a, a, an empowering because, as we know, in the early church, that they, they did, you know, have, have, have gifts, certain gifts. I personally believe are saved now, cease now, but were around in in the early church to authenticate. You know that the apostles, as being they are genuine apostles, and also who Christ was. You know, I don't mean to kind of skip and mess about, but I just think I just love the way it all ties in. You know, and and you should ought to get the point in Acts chapter one and two. All right. Well, you you created a lot of. Um subject matter and, and questions in my mind I'll, I'll bring up but let me ask brother Joe to comment first well my comment first of all is I'm, I'm loving the fact that Bill's here today and going first because I was drawing a complete blank on any commentary but after what Bill said uh, that really brings to mind you know the baptism of water was an act of men I mean it's something you had to do in order to uh, uh, symbolically follow God and with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, man didn't have to do anything. Uh, God, God uh, did it all. The Holy Spirit filled them without any works of theirs. And so uh, they were just as surprised as, uh, as could be. And so uh, John was 
uh, participating in the acts of the law, and now that Christ is uh, atoned for our sins, the Holy Spirit does it all. We just have to be willing and able to just stand there and receive. Okay. Uh, well, Bill, you, you expressed uh, concern about going off on a tangent, and uh, I would say that Let's not worry about that. Let's let's feel free a little bit. If, if we want to go off on a tangent, as long as it doesn't go take us for an hour, you know. But if we we need to take five minutes to go off and to discuss something else, I don't I don't think that that's any harm. It might be very helpful to all of us. But uh, you you brought up something. <laughs> you talk about can of worms. Uh, now I I've drawn the distinction many times in my videos. The difference between the, the phrases and terminology, baptism of the Holy Spirit, indwelling of the Spirit, uh, sealed with the Spirit, and uh, is there another one? Okay, I think that's yeah. They, they, they don't mean the same thing, but I think this reference that you cited here in John was an example of Old Testament times when many times God would fill a prophet with the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus breathed into them, they got the Holy Spirit, and that was to give them the power to do these miraculous works. Uh, but when they were filled with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, it was not a, a sealing. It was not an indwelling where the Holy Spirit was going to continue to live in them and would never leave them. It was just a temporary power that God gave them. Uh, the Holy Spirit would work through them. And uh, But here's the question. You said... You said they got saved when he breathed in them. Then you corrected yourself, I guess, and said, well, they were saved before that. And here's the question. Um, the, the, the apostles, and, and also, not just the apostles, but many people throughout the, the scriptures, how did they get saved? Uh, they got saved, as we believe, that it's faith alone, by, by grace alone. Oh, it's not by any religious works from, from Genesis 1-1 all the way through. Religious works do not ever factor in to our salvation. We're all in agreement upon that. This is a great dividing point in the church thinking. Some people think that works are required now. Some people say, well, they're not required now, but they used to be required. And someday in the future, they're going to, works are going to be required again. But we, I think we're all in agreement that works were never required. Um, it's always been by the grace of God through faith alone. Now, but faith alone, in Christ alone now, because he's been revealed. But before that, they were saved by faith alone in the one to come who would be the Redeemer. So, if that's the case, then um, were the apostles saved before they got saved, as we would think, well, by believing him after the cross and the resurrection. And if they were saved before, uh, was there a need for them to really get saved since they already believed in the, 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 the promise? Uh, that uh, is, I don't know if I even expressed it very clearly, but Bill? Yeah, and, I, and I'm sympathizing with you because even I, I didn't express it clearly, clearly, you know, because obviously we, we know they were saved when they believed on Christ. And, and like I said, I brought up the example when, when Christ was washing the feet, you know, saying you're all clean now. And apart from one, i.e. Judas Iscariot. So we know, know they were saved then. <clears throat> and then obviously the breathing of the Holy Ghost upon him is probably, a, as you've just said, it was them being empowered I, with, with these gifts which, which were going to be manifest in the early church. And then obviously come Pentecost, you know, that, that, that gift that was given to the apostle was also endowed and given upon you know you know the people there the three thousand. So yeah, we we have to be uh, systematic, I suppose, and try and get things in the right order. I was it confuses people. You know the Pentecostals would would say that you know nothing really happened. No one was saved until after the Holy Spirit was poured on mass. You know in Acts chapter two, but we know that's not true because of what Jesus said when he washed their feet. And I think this John 22 helps to bridge those two, you know, in that, yet yeah, they was already saved. Christ breathed on the apostles. They received, the, obviously, this empowering that was going to really be manifest in Acts chapter 2. 
then when we get to Acts chapter 2, you know, the Holy Spirit came en masse. So, yeah, it's, it's trying to express it in easy terms, but I, I think that's probably what happened. <laughs> Uh, let me let me get a second chance here before we go on to Joe here, um, uh, because I'm not sure I even made this distinction well enough here. But let's take one individual for a moment. Let's just talk about the apostle John, for example. Let's suppose that John had died before he even met Jesus. Was John saved? Uh, well, I, I thank God that. Uh, Bill opened the can of worms because usually that's that's a, a distinction that, that I've been uh, labeled with. Listen, John was saved, and and uh, you're going to think this silly, but what the way my mind works is I go back to Abraham. Abraham uh, was saved uh, through faith, not through works, uh, in that he trusted God. But Abraham's too big a name. Let's take one of the 300 soldiers that were with Gideon uh, when he, he uh, uh, went against the, the city, whatever it was. Now, just take any one of them. Let's say Bob. Bob was one of the 300 soldiers. Do you really think Bob had any knowledge at all that there was going to be a Savior that was going to come in bodily form and be crucified and raised again uh, for his salvation? I don't think Bob knew. Bob was too busy looking out for enemies while he was cupping water to his face before the big battle. Yet I'm pretty sure Bob was uh, redeemed. Bob was uh, known by God and knew God through faith in God. And I think that's where we come back to uh, we're judged by the light given. And so uh, uh, I'll just leave it there. Back to you. Yeah. All right. I. Uh, well... Yeah, Bob, of course, in those times, they had faith that um, in the in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that this God would be the Redeemer if they put their faith in him. And gradually more was revealed about the God. And now we're expected to, to have faith more completely in this particular person who's completed the, the work for our salvation. Um, so I, I think you're right about Bob, uh, but... My question goes back to Bill here. Do you think in this example I gave you, John was saved if, if, if he had died before he met Jesus? Would you say that John was saved? Or, or what's your thoughts? Well, yeah, yeah. And now you're going to open another can of worms because we're going to have to start talking about Abraham's bosom and stuff. <laughs> so I would say, yeah, if he had faith in God, obviously not complete understanding as they did receive obviously if he didn't die but obviously we know that that Christ went down and he preached it and you know, those in Abraham's bosom were, were, were taken up in the glory so yeah if he had faith in God as as much as he was you know known then you know he would have been saved so yeah and Bob as well Bob, Bob, Bob's going to heaven as well yeah, Bob's a fictitious character. There were no Bobs in the Bible, not one. <laughs> but, but that question I just asked, what do you think, Joe? That's kind of like one of your questions. Let's yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a valid question, uh, Luke. I, you know, I, I don't have any question that, that, uh, that John was saved, but then again, that's based on an assumption, not that I've ever given it any consideration. So uh, I'm assuming he was. And if I give it a lot of thought, I'm sure that I'd come to that to the conclusion being correct. But I I don't know how I'd get there. Uh, so it's a, it's a it's a damn good question. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that even by us discussing this, that it's another reason for someone to label us as heretics just because we're speculating that they were saved even before they knew about Jesus uh, bec because of uh, the Old Testament uh, uh, conditions for salvation. Uh, okay, let me go on. I'll read a little further. Uh, where am I? Uh, uh, verse 6, I think. Uh, no, I think it's verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. 
uh, when they there, this is verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Uh, I'll stop it there. I guess that's verse 5, 6, and 7 together. Brother Bill? Yeah, what is interesting, I'll tell you, and this is another reason why the, the Holy Spirit was poured out en masse, because, you know, the Holy Spirit reveals Christ and reveals truth, is even at that point there, you know, they're still talking about the kingdom. You know, they said, you know, when therefore they come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? So they're still in in a carnal mindset, assuming that you know, God was going to come and reign over the kingdom of Israel physically. So that their, their minds were still not completely where it should have been. And I think that that is a big part of why the Holy Spirit had to come to reveal this truth at Pentecost. Yeah, this this verse. Uh... Uh, can open up a, another can of worms of, uh, based upon everybody's varying views on eschatology here. But uh, without going into that, Brother Joe? Yeah, that, I, that's why I love doing these studies, Luke. I don't ever remember this. This is kind of mind-boggling. After the Lord was crucified and after he rose, they're still waiting for that physical kingdom. They're waiting for him to go throw a... Uh, uh, Caesar off of his uh, pedestal and and uh, and make Israel the the uh, dominant political force in the world. You know, I mean, what really? After all that, uh, and they're still looking for the the kingdom here on earth. Uh, that boggles the mind of us now. The you know hindsight's twenty twenty, right? But uh, yeah, I'm fascinated that they were like their first question that they're listing here is, hey. Uh, when are you going to go topple Caesar and make Israel the, the dominant political force? It's really mind-boggling. Yeah, it really is, I mean, especially when you consider how many times Jesus would state something so clearly. I mean, sometimes he, he spoke in parables to confuse other people, but the apostles, he would, he would explain it. He, he explained the parables, and he, and he spoke very plainly. Well, look, you know... They did, when he talked about his death, burial, and resurrection, I mean, if they weren't confused, he said, let me say clearly, they're going to kill me. <laughs> you know, Let me make this so he, nobody can be confused, but I'll be raised, I'll raise myself from the dead. And so he said a lot of things that were very plain. And when asked about the kingdom er, uh, earlier in, in his incarnation, he says, don't, don't uh, say, believe in, uh, if someone says low here or low there is the kingdom, he says the kingdom is not a place, but the kingdom is within. It's spiritual, and the kingdom is now. So he's set up the kingdom already, and it's a spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are interchangeable terms, uh, whereas there's a lot, large group of people, though, that uh, they, they draw this distinction that there are two different things. I made a video. To, I'm, uh, I have a playlist titled uh, Dispensations, Dispensationalism, Futurism, Millennialism. I forgot. There's more to the title, but all these things are in that playlist. And uh, that's one of the things that I, I think that I have been converted in my viewpoint from this futurism of Darby and Schofield to uh, um, the, a different viewpoint on on this, that, uh, this, uh, this kingdom was already established and it's now and the kingdom has been going on now for a couple thousand years and it's spiritual but you're right it is mind-boggling that their their the first thoughts out of their questions is well now now can we get our positions of authority sitting on your right hand and your left hand and you know I want to be the governor <laughs> you know, that's their thoughts uh, all right before I go on any, any further things to uh, Bill no, other than I'm going to have to look at your your playlist about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. So I'm going to have to have a real 
good look into that because, like I said, I'm still, you know, on the fence there and not 100% convinced. So I'm going to look forward to watching that next. All right, good. I hope you do. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, brother, brother Joe. Yeah, that's a ditto for me. Uh, I, I, I'm not uh, certain of a lot of things, and that's one of them. But I will, I will uh, harken back to what Bill said. You know, they were in a carnal mindset still. And so uh, the filling of the Spirit was uh, temporary and, and, uh, and uh, for specific purposes before Christ. And now that he's leaving, uh, it's a built spirits with us all the time. And so, yeah, they were, they were stuck in that uh, carnal mindset for sure. All right, good. Let me continue then. Um, I'm going to read 5, 6, and 7 in the Amplified just to see if anything jumps out that's helpful. Uh, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized and empowered and united with the Holy Spirit not long from now. So when they had come together, they asked him repeatedly, Lord, are you at this time reestablishing the kingdom and restoring it to Israel? Um, and he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Okay. Uh, verse 8 in the KJV. Uh, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That to me is a very important verse there, Brother Bill. Yep, that really is, and I think it actually backs up, you know, perhaps what we're all thinking and what we're all saying, that, you know, in that they shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon them. Not they shall receive salvation, not that they're, you know, saved by faith alone, but they shall receive a power from the Holy, you know, the Holy Ghost. And, and as we know, you know, as we're going to go, I don't want to give too much away, but as we go through, obviously, the book of Acts, we see, firstly, the Jews being empowered with certain apostolic gifts and the lot, and, and then later on. But, yeah, it's the, the, the word power that, to me, you know, you know, it, it is, is hitting the point. It's not to do with receiving the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, this kind of Pentecostal Holy Spirit for salvation, but rather it is receiving power so they can be witnesses you know throughout the earth because we know salvation comes by faith alone all right and brother joe yeah it's uh what i find interesting is is uh, the last part the uttermost parts of the earth in uh, the book of revelations uh, all seven of the churches mentioned i believe are are outside of israel and into the gentile world i think uh yeah this is the church age and the uttermost parts of the earth they had no idea uh, what Christ was probably talking about, and uh, it's fascinating that all the all the apostles except Paul, pretty much. I mean, Peter did minister to Gentiles too, but I mean, they were all pretty much focused on Israel, just the one, it, just the one, uh, pretty much uh, uh, was representative to the uttermost parts of the world, and so uh, I find that pretty fascinating. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think you both hit upon the two things that I think are really significant in that verse. And one is receiving this power from the Holy Spirit. And, and as Bill said, uh, the power. And they, they received the power before in this incarnation. He would breathe on them and give them the power, send them off on a mission. And they do miraculous signs and come back and give them a report. And uh, but, but now they're going to receive the Holy Spirit permanently. And, but this power they're going to receive, uh, these, particularly Paul talks about these gifts and powers, and, and, and he says that these things are all going to cease. Uh, so uh, I am in agreement that uh, the uh, there's a verse in John that was uh, troubled me for many years. And as I did the study on John uh, a few months ago, um, the epiphany. I, I got it for the first time, and I'm so happy because I was kind of distressed. The, the verse says, if you ask anything in my name, it will be given to you. And then, of course, the 
the, the name it and claim it preachers, you know, take that verse and others like it uh, to, to teach that you, 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 you'll get anything you ask if, if, you're, uh, if you have enough faith, uh, unless there's some sin in your life. Like if your prayers are not answered, then there's got to be some sin in your life you've got to repent of, or or your faith is not strong enough. But if you're if you got your sin out out of your life, and if your faith is strong enough, you're going to get anything, whether it's a million dollars or whether you're going to be able to walk again, even though your spine was paralyzed. You know, so this is how they take that verse, and so I was always, you know, I I never believed it. That was the right take on on this promise um, because you know I've asked things in the name of Jesus and I didn't get everything I've asked for I still ask for things every day for Jesus and sometimes I'm not getting it and so uh, of course the Bible doesn't say that it's because of sin or because of lack of faith but but um, so I realized when I was teaching John recently I looked at the context of that, and this was told to these, these apostles when Jesus sent them off on these missions to do these miraculous signs, because the signs that the apostles did and the miracles that Jesus did, these were all done to show the Jews that, hey, he's the real deal. He's, he is the Savior that was, was promised. So uh, uh, in that case, they did have the power, anything they needed to do would be done because the purpose, but it was temporary. It was only during that period of time. And and as Bill has pointed out that in the, the charismatics and Pentecostals, you know, that they want to take the gifts that were given to the early church to serve a purpose for a brief period of time to jump start the, the church and get the faith started. They want to say that's all that still applies to all of us today when it's and when it's clear it, it's it's not for us today but the, the other point the bill I mean that Joe brought up about the whole world and this is this is the problem with the Paul only -ness. I have a playlist Paul only -ism debunked and they they believe that Paul was the the not only the first but the only apostle to the Gentiles but where we see here that these apostles were told right then to go preach to Judea, Samaria, and all parts of the world. And uh, they did. The historical accounts show that they all died martyrs' deaths all over the world, in Africa and India and everywhere. And so in my Paul Onlyism playlist, I show that not only was Paul not the uh, f first, he was not the only apostle of the Gentiles. Peter was. We're going to come into that pretty soon, but um, but he certainly wasn't. He, he wasn't only the only one. He wasn't even the first. Uh, that all the apostles preached to the Gentiles, but for a brief period of time, they're in Jerusalem. Um, anything? But before I go on, anything you want to say about any of that? Nothing for me, Luke. Not, not. Okay, let me read for um, um, Verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. That's it. Bill, well, how do you explain that one? Well, he was gone. He was gone in the glory. He can't, you can't sign you for nothing than that, but that would have been some sight to see anyway, I tell you. And, and although, although we're obviously not going to, you know, we weren't those who have seen him, you know, ascend into heaven, you know, we are certainly going to be, I hope and pray, of those that will see him, you know, descend from heaven and, and catch us back up. All right, Brother Joe? Yeah, yeah. It, must, it must have been uh, quite a shock because you remember what happened when they crucified him. Everyone went into a state of uh, anxiety and loss and no direction and back to fishing we go. And, uh, you know, they've got him back and they've had him for 40 days and, and uh, God is with them. 
you know, in a physical presence, and, and their faith is not only restored, but it's uh, it's just exponentially uh, restored. And now he's leaving again. Uh, that had to be uh, both an amazing thing to see and a hard pill to swallow, not knowing what was coming from the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's uh, glad you said that. Um, that's not really what I was thinking when I read the verse. Uh, my emphasis was entirely different, but but the point you made there is really probably the most important thing. I think that verse that uh, yeah, he was gone. Now he's resurrected. They got him again, and now he's leaving again. And now they ha how long? I don't know the period of time. If you know, let me. Tell me, but the gap between the Ascension and Pentecost, I don't know if the, exactly, I might say somewhere so many days pass, uh, but uh, so they but they don't know. They have to go to Jerusalem and wait for something. Uh, so yeah, that, I could see how this could be very distressing, sad, worrisome, uh, another test of their faith, what's going to happen next, if anything. Um, but to me, going up in the cloud. First of all, he's going out bodily. He's not disintegrating like in a in a Star Trek where you get, you beam up and they just like the molecules all come apart and they're cast off somewhere and then reassembled. You can he, he's intact. He's like levitating. If I if I'm if I'm imagining this correctly according to the verse, he's levitating up into a, a cloud and then the cloud, as it says in the Amplified. It says, um, uh, and he, and after he said these things, he was caught up as they looked on, and a cloud took him up out of their sight. And, and the KJB says, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Um, but <laughs> there are people that think that Jesus is an alien, and this cloud was a spaceship, and he was just levitated up into a spaceship and the spaceship flew off you know there's a lot of different ways of taking you know, taking that verse but uh, all right anything else you want to say before we go on bill no but I'm really looking forward to the very next verse all right Joe anything else uh, ditto go ahead Luke. okay all right the next verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go un into heaven. All right, that's 10 and 11. I assume you wanted them together, Bill. Go ahead. Yeah, what, what is fascinating about this, you know, every time I've read especially 10 so much, it always reminds me of Abraham. You know, when the free visit Abraham, I always see that as like a triune happening. And, and then you see here almost the same thing again. Abraham being the father of faith, now the faith is kicking in again. You're seeing Christ being taken up into heaven. And again, beside him, two men in white apparel. To me, this is me, you know, I, I'm always suggesting here a bit because it doesn't say who they are. But, you know, I, I always sit as a wonderment, as in the triune God, you know, that the, the, the Father and Holy Spirit were there in a white parallel, comforting, you know, the, 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 the saints as Christ is taken into heaven. I just find, I always see a link between, you know, what happened there and what happened in Genesis 18 with Abraham. Hmm. Okay, Brother Joe? Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good point Bill made. I, I was, you know, again, I, I like doing these studies because my memory uh, is always different than what we find some, but I always thought the three appeared together and all three went up, but that's not how it says it happened. It says that, uh, that they appeared to them after Christ went up, and so uh, uh, that's fascinating. And I always thought they knew who they were. You know that uh, it was. Uh, didn't Peter say, "Let's build a shrine"? Maybe that's further on in the in the chapter here. But uh, somehow they knew who the men were. So there's some 
some uh, stuff I don't understand here. But uh, yeah, back to you. Yeah, I. Uh, it's, uh, this is the wonderful thing about studying with uh, the brothers, uh, is that you you get insights that you know that never occurred to me, but uh, that's why I, I'll always remember how you you taught me about the uh, the Paul the, the thorn in the flesh of Paul. I never got it right, and finally uh, Bill explained it to me, and so it's really rewarding to study together because. Uh, so it's possible for an individual to read a verse a hundred times over the years, and then, but and someone else sees see something that was so obvious you just didn't get it. But this may not be that profound, but it it, it very well may be a, a, a very very much the same kind of a thing, uh, because with Abraham, um, it was uh, we we believe that this is a Christophany. And, Many people, at least who I believe it was a Christophany, where Jesus appeared to Abraham and he had two angels. Uh, but they're an angel, just a messenger. So I, I, I'm not sure uh, what. Uh, they could very well be, it could be a picture of the Godhead again. Uh, uh, I, you know, I don't know if you're aware of this, Brother Bill, but you're an angel, according to the uh, book of Revelation. When it talks about uh, the angel of each church, it's the angel literally translates to messenger. And, and uh, Bill, when you give the message of salvation, you're an angel, uh, one giving a message. In this case, you're an evangelist. Eve is a prefix that means the good. You, you're the one given the good message, the good news. So maybe these were uh, not angels in the sense that we we think of. Uh, as some uh, a spiritual being that's non-human and not God, but 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 truly, maybe with Abraham, it was the Godhead, and they were messengers in the sense they were delivering the message of of uh, destruction and judgment. Uh, I don't know, but it is interesting how you have the two men. But if they were uh, familiar, it seems to me they would have named them, because but apparently they were unknown men to them. But if they were unknown men to them, and they and the, they're saying this profound thing to them, it seemed like the the apostles would want to elaborate even further about these these unknown men. They're giving them this. Um, so this could very well be two angels that are uh, referred to as men, but they're giving a message uh, to them. Um, maybe we're reading too much into it, but it's still interesting to do it. Uh, before I go on, anything else, Bill or John, Bill? For well, yeah, it's just it's just so interesting. And I think I think it was probably last year, or maybe the the year before, that that we coined the phrase uh, triophony, because you have obviously you have a, a theophany, which is which is the you know God, and we have a Christophany, which is Christ. And I think it might have even been on a study to do with Abraham. You know, we coined the phrase, perhaps it was a triophany. Who knows? It, you know, there's so many things still a mystery, but it's always good to, you know, as a, allow bright on things and encourage one another with such things. Yeah, that's a it, it's a new uh, term. I've never heard anybody else say it before, but uh, we we don't we do know that there's a triophany or triophany or whatever. It, Correct way is uh, at the baptism. We got simultaneous appearance of Jesus, God in the flesh, and the Holy Spirit ascending in the manner of a dove, and the Father, Holy Father, speaking right there, is saying, "This is my beloved Son." So that would be a, clearly a triophany. And there's others that may possibly be triophanies. <clears throat> Go ahead, Brother Joe. Well, uh, I think Bill ought to make a video on uh, on the thorn in the flesh for Paul. I know we're off topic here, but uh, I am I still think of that. Uh, I thought of it a dozen times since you explained it to me, Luke. I think we were off air. Uh, but anyway, isn't there a part of the Bible where it said that uh, Peter wanted to build a shrine to the three, to the, you know, to uh, Abraham and Enoch, was it? I forget who showed up. Uh, and this appears like they didn't know who it was, so I'm confused. Uh, my memory doesn't serve me here. But uh, that 
that's it. Back to you. Yeah, that's in the uh, in the Transfiguration. Is Elijah, uh, Moses and Elijah, at the Transfiguration, and Peter wanted to build it, but God the Father put him in his place and said, "Hey, you're you're missing the point. This is about Jesus. You know, don't. That's all. The others are irrelevant. These are just minor. These are characters, but this is God in the flesh. You're my son. So, uh, um, all right. Let me read the next verse here." Um, verse 12 um, then oh by the way we none of us talked about this last part of verse 11 uh, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven surprise we neglected that part of it uh, anything you want to say about that before I go on Bill no no self explanatory that basically the way they saw the you know, Christ descended in heaven. He's gonna come down from heaven and, and, and catch us up. So, yeah. All right, Joe. I would I would disagree with Bill on that just a little bit. I I I, I think that when we're caught up uh, uh, to meet Christ in the clouds, I think this is referring to more uh, Jewish uh, 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 return of Christ when he sets his foot on the Mount of Olives and splits it in two. Uh, the, everyone will see him, and, and uh, uh, that's his uh, second coming with the church. Uh, I think that may be what it's referring to, but I could be wrong. No, no, I think that, I, I, I humbly say I think I stand corrected there. I think you are probably wrong, you know, but, you know, without obviously getting into eschatology, you know, we'll leave it at that. But I think you're probably more accurate in that sense. All right. Well, I would say that you're both right and you're both wrong, uh, because I, I I view the uh, the second coming as a singular event, and not 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 two separate events, especially not two events separated by seven years. There's a uh, the resurrection and the the coming of Jesus, the return as it's cited here. That would be a, a, a one event at the end of uh, the end of the world. But again, that's watch my teaching on. Uh, Futurism, dispensations, and all that. Um, let me put that link there, uh, Luke, if you would, on that specific video. If you'll put a link on the video after we're done. Okay, I'll try. I try to remember to send you the, the either the video or the playlist. Um, let me see. Uh, uh, verse twelve. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Um, I, uh, I don't know if you have anything to say about that, but I have a question. But So let me give you a chance to comment on that, Bill, and see if you cover what I, I'm thinking. Well, I don't know if I'll cover what you're thinking, but it probably proves that <laughs> the brother Sebastian is right, because, he had, because they was on the Mount Olivet, and we know when Christ returns, regardless of eschatology and stuff, you know, he's going to land there and he's going to split that asunder. So, you know, that probably gives further credence to what that brother, brother Sebastian said. Uh, brother, brother Joe, what do you want to say about that? Brother? Oh, uh, just that uh, Bill's right. I'm right. <laughs> I just joking. I thought that we we established earlier that we should just always uh, uh, just uh, always have the position that Bill's going to be right 99% of the time. So just and, but now you're saying you're the one that's right. Okay. He's got his one. He's got his one percent. You've got to let him have his one percent every now and then. <laughs> All right. But here's my question, and this may seem like a trivial point, but I, maybe you can explain it to me. Uh, it says, uh, then they returned unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. Let me read it in the Amplified. Um, then the disciples returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, uh, which is near Jerusalem, only a Sabbath day's journey. Okay, and in parentheses it says less than one mile away. 
Um, but I was wondering, what is a, a Sabbath day journey? Uh, I don't understand that at all. I, I'm thinking Sabbath, that's the seventh day, it's, one, it's, a, it's a single day, and, and then this translation in the Amplified, it refers to this Sabbath day's journey distance as a distance of less than one mile. But um, it may not be an important point, but I'm just curious, and you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, only that the Sabbath you're supposed to rest. So if you're going to have a walk on a Sabbath day, you've got to make it real slow. So a mile would probably take a whole day. <laughs> That's my only thought. Yeah, yeah. I've got a neighbor, uh, well, not a neighbor, but uh, a famous guy lives uh, pretty close to me, uh, Michael Medved. He's a conservative uh, Jewish talk show host. And uh, he came in uh, uh, on the Sabbath day, uh, and actually he was getting close to home when the sun went down, and he had to actually have the car stop, and he had to get out and walk the rest of the way, because they, they can't take a, a mechanical conveyance on the Sabbath. So maybe they had to park their Aston Martins back then or something. I don't know. Yeah, uh, the, the more we talk about it, I, I think it's probably right that the the Sabbath day journey, uh, you know, they had all these laws. And in addition to the laws, the rabbis added even more, uh, and some of it was very stringent, uh, rules about the stretch Sabbath that not only were you not allowed to work, but if you were going to pick up and carry an object, the object couldn't be any larger than certain dimensions, and no more than a certain number of steps could be taken. Or you're working and so maybe a Sabbath day journey is something that they addressed and gave a formula and said on the Sabbath you're only allowed to go you cannot go more than a mile I don't know all right let me read further uh, verse 13 and when they were come in uh, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter James and John and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. Um, okay, I've thought about this, but who is this Judas, the brother of James? Bill? Well, he certainly, he certainly wasn't Judas Iscariot, because his guts have been spilled by then. All right, Brother Joe. Well, I was just doing a quick count. I count 12 guys. Uh, so uh, this would have been the apostles, all of them. Uh, am I counting right? One, two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Yeah, I think there's 12 there. So that would have been the, the whole crew, everybody. <laughs> Oh, the only problem is Judas Iscariot is dead. He's not with them. Remember, they, they only have 11 now. So this Judas, uh, the, the brother of James. Now, there's another James mentioned already. According to the original apostles, we have um, Peter and Andrew are brothers. They're both mentioned here. James and John are brothers. They're mentioned here. So who's this other James? This, uh, the one you also got, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. Um, it, well, it's, you know, so I was going to say, it's probably, it might have been one of Christ's other brothers, because we know that James was a brother of Christ, literal brother, so it could have been a brother of Christ, because I've, I've counted 11, which is right, because obviously Judas, you know, had only self put him. Well, I, I think, but then, you know, I, I certainly may be wrong because it does mention this in that list. It says James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. It seems to me, though, if this Judas, the brother of James, was the, the, the James mentioned earlier, 
that it would that, that it would flow together. It would say James, the son of Alphaeus, and Judas, his James's brother, and Simon Zelotes. But because it's separated by Simon Zelotes, I'm thinking that James, the son of Alphaeus, is not the same James as this referred to here in the end, J Judas, the brother of James. I'm thinking Judas, the brother of James. Uh, I believe these are the brothers of Jesus here, uh, because we know that. Uh, James, uh, after the resurrection, he believed, and Jude, Judas, which is another name for Jude, uh, the book of Jude was written by uh, the other brother of Jesus, uh, most people believe, um, and so uh, this could be the two brothers of Jesus here, I'm, I'm supposing, uh, does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, that's what, I, yeah that's, that's what I've concluded as well, so I, I concur with what you said. Okay, uh, let me uh, let me read in the Amplified. Sometimes it adds there, explains things. Uh, uh, when they had entered the city, they went upstairs to the upper room where they were staying indefinitely. That is Peter and John and his brother James um, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, who's named, also named Nathaniel, uh, and Matthew. Uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, Judas Thaddeus, the son of James. Hmm. See, that one says Judas is the son of James. That's the uh, amplified translation. That is weird. I never expected that. No, um, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, to me, the amplified, uh, it has... A lot of interesting comments inserted in there that's sometimes helpful, and then and then sometimes it comes up with something that just oh, man I'm gonna punch someone. That's just that's crazy. But in this case, I don't I don't know. So I, I'm, I'll go with the KJV here. Uh, ver, let's go to verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Uh, so here it's, uh, it's saying that his brethren were, were there with the mother and Jesus' brethren. Uh, so I don't know if it's referencing back to Judas and James here or if this is, or if we're wrong about Judas and James. <clears throat> but uh, verse 15, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, uh, The number of names together were about 120 men and brethren. This scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Um, I guess I'll stop there. But Bill? Yes, yeah, self-explanatory there. Obviously, you know, the, the, the you know, prophecy was fulfilled. Judas Iscariot did God, he did betray Christ. And, you know, when it mentions brethren there, it could be either or either, it could be re-mentioning the names which were forementioned, or talking about other, other brethren. Uh, Joe, any thoughts? Uh, just, just, uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know. They said they waited with prayer and supplication. I get the prayer. I, I'll show my ignorance. What is what is what is uh, what do you do when you spend days and days of supplication? What is that? What's that mean? Uh, supplication is a form of prayer. Uh, you have prayers of um, of um, um, worship, praising God. You have prayers of thanksgiving, where you're thanking God. You have prayers of supplication, where you're asking God to supply a need. And you have prayers of intercession, which means you're praying on someone else's behalf. So uh, the supplication just means you uh, you have a something need something needs to be supplied to you. And Bill puts in earnest prayer. Okay, uh, brother Joe, you, you want to say anything before I go through? No, no, that was my only thought. It was uh, ringing between the ears. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right, now, 
Now I know that I've, I've looked this up before about this reference to this uh, what must be fulfilled and there's two references David and what's the other one is there a footnote here let me look at the amplified usually they have some footnotes uh, Well, verse we on. No, that's all right. Uh, I'll just go on. I have some thoughts, but I'm not. I don't. It's not clear enough for me to expound upon it. So, um, uh, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been. I'm going to read that in the Amplified, verse 16. Brothers and sisters, it was necessary that the scripture be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the lips of David, king of Israel, and Judas Iscariot, no, about Judas Iscariot, who acted as guide to those arrested Jesus. <clears throat> so they're saying that there was a prophecy uh, from David about Judas. Um, verse 18, now this man... Uh, okay, verse 17, for he was numbered with us and had obtained, uh, had obtained part of this ministry. This is uh, a part of that uh, statement by David or prophecy. 18, now this man purchased a field with a reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Bill? Yeah, that's what I was talking about earlier, didn't I? You know, when, when he hung himself, uh, and actually, you know, if you read the scriptures again in the Gospels, that it was actually, you know, sort of one of those hard, hard scriptures that actually God uh, ripped his bowels out of him. You know, so, yeah, that, that, that's a statement of fact right there. Oh, Brother Joe? Uh, just, just horrifying, horrifying, uh, you know, that... Uh, Judas uh, put himself in that position to do what he did, you know, uh, to purchase the field with rewards of iniquity, and then uh, his end. I, I, I hate reading that. That's very sad. Well, um, you know, Judas threw the silver back at the priests in the temple. He, he didn't have the 30 pieces, but it was the, the, the priests idea they were told to use it to purchase the potter's field so it was Judas's money that was used they would not accept it back so Judas didn't actually purchase the field but here's the question you know we're told that Jesus hanged himself so we, we believe his death was death by hanging but we're also told here that his guts were spilled out and so people say, see, there's a contradiction there. Um, was he was he killed by his guts being split, spilled out or hanging? And Dr. Ruckman, he, he attempts to answer it by saying that he hung himself, but the branch was old, it broke, and he fell on rocks, and the rocks, you know, he splattered it, it was splattered on the rocks, and got spilled out. Uh, obviously, we don't know. We don't know exactly how it happened, but uh, the, this is uh, an example of, of an apparent contradiction that uh, people try to find ways of explaining it. Brother Bill? Yeah, I, I see no contradiction there, there at all. I, I think they have the <clears throat> arguing a toss over nothingness there. You know, we know that he, he's blood was spilled, his guts come out, you know, and, and that's as simple as that, you know, <clears throat> to me anyway. All right, Brother Joe, any thoughts? On My only thoughts are that uh, uh, I don't like dwelling on, on this uh, little section, but uh, having said that, there's nothing that's put in the in the Word that's not significant and, and has... Uh, some more depth and surface, but it's one of those things I, I personally just haven't, don't plan on thinking a lot about. Back to you. All right. Read. 
read further here. Um, Verse 19, and it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem. Oh, let me read verse 18 in the Amplified just to see how they take their take on it. Now Judas Iscariot acquired a piece of land indirectly. So that word indirectly is it, it, it conforms to the, my explanation. Uh, with the money paid him as a reward for his treachery and falling headlong, his his body burst open in the middle, and uh, all his intestines poured out. Okay, now back to KJV verse nineteen, <clears throat> and it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, Akel Dama. Uh, that is to say, the field of blood. I know that when I try to pronounce some of these words here, I'm probably way off on the proper pronunciation, but <clears throat> it says, the field of blood. Uh, verse 24, it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. <clears throat> okay, so I know what... Uh, now here, if we look at the Amplify, it says, oh, I'm sorry, I don't want to comment first. I, Brother Bill? Yep, yeah, I'm still catched up and reading on it. Yeah, again, this is self, self-explanatory. self You know, what, what actually happened to him. And, and obviously we know that they cast lots, didn't they, uh, uh, to, to replace Judas. So to me, it's... Self-explanatory. Uh, Joe? Yeah, uh, yeah. what Bill said, you know, I, I uh, am fascinated that he would have been considered a, a, a bishop had he not uh, betrayed Christ. And uh, I'm sure there's something deeper there, but no more thoughts really. Mm hmm Yeah. Well... Uh, that word bishopric probably would be appear differently. I mean, it just in the, not even look at all the translations, but in the Amplified it says, "Let another take his position as overseer." Uh, um, yes, basically, bishopric is old English for overseer or elder, basically. Okay. All right. Let me. Uh, Verse 21, wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Bill? Well, yeah, because that, that is a part of being a, an apostle, you know, to see the risen Lord. And, again, uh, later on we see, as we go through the book of Acts, that, that the apostle Paul says, have I not seen the risen Lord? You know, he expresses that in his epistles. You know, when he had to defend that he was a genuine apostle, because there was there was people, you know, who, who were coming against him saying he wasn't. But obviously, we, we know for a fact that you know he saw the risen Lord you know, on the road to Damascus. So that you know that is one qualification of a genuine apostle, and that's why you know I believe, and I hope I assume everyone on the panel believes that you know genuine apostles do not exist today because you know, they have not seen the risen Lord. Mm -hmm. Brother Joe, yeah, it it. it uh somewhere between bothers me and cracks me up to, to see uh, all the brothers who uh, believe that uh, they're apostles today. Uh, I think Jack Hayford called himself an apostle and, uh, and others uh, equally well known. Uh, so I, I don't get how they see that. Maybe, uh, maybe they think they have the fruit instead of the office of the apostle. I don't know. But uh, I believe the the apostleships were closed with Matthias, right? Well, yeah, well, well technically that was closed 
were, were Paul because you can't hear nothing from a vice. <laughs> and then obviously Paul then goes on to read, you know, write two thirds of the New Testament. Right. Well, I don't, off the top of my head, I can't really give you a definitive answer on that. But I, I know that there are several others that um, refer to as apostles. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if Apollos is called one, or uh, I think maybe Barnabas, maybe Saul. I don't know, and I'm not sure that they were all uh, eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Problem here, they're, they're saying at least for this purpose, of a point in, pointing at a replacement for Judas. For this purpose, this is a criteria. This, this you must have been an eyewitness. Uh, but the, the word apostle also has a, a more than one use. Uh, the strict use, of course, is these 12 closest disciples that he chose, uh, distinct from the others, and, and that, uh, and, and then believing. Of course, the number 12 is an important number in uh, in the Bible. 12 tribes of Israel, and then the 12 apostles, and the 12 elders. Or are there 24 elders? Maybe that's representative of both. The 24 elders is the representative of the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes. <clears throat> uh, but um, it seemed like they wanted this 12 to be completed instead of lacking and just having 11. Or, but was Matthias the, the 12th or was Paul the 12th? Well, if, if they're both apostles, then you have 13. All these things are questions that are interesting, but... Um, I forgot what I was even saying. Let me get back to the verses here. Oh, let me read this in the Amplified, see what, how it says it. Um, uh, verse 22 in the Amplified is what I want. It says, um, beginning with the baptism of John at the outset of Jesus' ministry until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become a witness with us to testify of his resurrection. So, at least to fill this void of uh, Judas, they wanted someone who was had been witness from the baptism through the resurrection period. Now, after that, Paul wasn't there for the baptism, and others that are identified as apostles are not. So, it's the... Uh, I think that this is the criteria to particularly fill, uh, replace an individual in that one office. Uh, before I read further, Bill? Yeah, this is, this is like I said, I talked about opening the can of worms again, second tonight. <laughs> but, yeah, I suppose the difference between Matthias and the Apostle Paul was Matthias was chosen kind of in a rush. Uh, you know, because there was lack of one obviously apostle because Judas hung himself, and, and they cast lots, so they was chosen by man. But then later on we see that the apostle Paul was chosen by God, so perhaps there's a you know a bit of that going on. But you know, th there's always been controversy in regard to was there twelve, was there thirteen, was twelve ordained by God or thirteen? So. My view is basically Matthias was chosen by man. You hear nothing really of him at all, and then Paul raised, you know, was raised up by God Himself. All right, Joe. Any other? Well, my my thought is uh, Bill just answered my question. That's 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 brilliant. I didn't, I hadn't uh, put that together, I guess. But yeah, that make what Bill said makes plenty of sense. Uh, I I would only add that uh, somewhere in the Bible it says. And these signs will follow the apostles, and so uh, you know, snake bites don't hurt them, and all this kind of stuff, uh, which uh, I think uh, passed with with the uh, apostles of Christ's time, and I don't see that today. Uh, back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, I think there's a portion in Revelation that talks about. 12 gates or 12 pearls or 12 different things and each one is is for each of the 12 apostles and so um, I know I'm not saying exactly right but the point is there's there's a, something for each of these 12 apostles and then the question is who's the 12th is it Paul or is it Matthias um, but that's 
I'm not sure. Uh, I personally, so, so I don't need to interject. I apologise. Right. Just that uh, you know, as Brother Joe just brought up a real valid point. You know, being bitten by a strong, you know, snake, fruit and poison, <laughs> and we know that the Apostle Paul did get bitten by a snake in Malta. So I think that pretty much authenticates, you know, him being the real deal. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I don't. Uh, if if anybody got the impression that I'm questioning his the authenticity of Paul being an apostle, uh, don't don't interpret that way. I didn't mean. Oh that. no 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 no. I was just making the distinction between Matthias and, and Paul. Okay, let me read further. I I I also think that um, your point. I think as we go further, let me see if it says any more about that because I if it says more, I want to include that. But uh, about. This apostle, let me see. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice. I think Justice is mentioned again uh, in the uh, as we as we continue along somewhere, but maybe I'm wrong. And Matthias, and they prayed and said, "Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen." That, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave uh, forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So to talk further about what Bill was saying, is uh, I've, I've always felt leaned to the interpretation that this is not necessarily God's uh, will. Uh, maybe they are in their enthusiasm, particularly Peter, who's always jumping forward without thinking, and, and uh, the first to want to speak and act. And, and uh, maybe, uh, maybe they didn't wait for God to guide them on this. Uh, they felt that they needed to replace him, and this is their man-made method. Now, using lots to determine spiritual things was a common thing in among the Jews, but I, I, I'm suspicious about this whole thing, whether this was God, God's way of picking the, uh, the replacement, if there, even if there had to be a replacement, I'm not sure, uh, we know Paul was officially declared as an apostle by God, uh, so, uh, all right, that's my, oh, I'm sure, I went out of turn, didn't I, Bill, I wanted you to talk about that. Well, yeah, I think, like I said, because we do have examples, you know, of, of people. God always sorts out in the end, but we have examples all throughout Scripture of, of people doing their own kind of thing, you know, and, and I suppose there's a mass panic. Like, we've got to choose an apostle. If God wills it, let's cast a lot, see what happens. Landed on the fire. Then, let's say, you scarce hear him again, if you even do. And, and then God has to raise up the apostle, you know, Paul, you know, on the on the road to Damascus, you know, I think we, you know, I can't remember, I can't recall it verbatim. All I know it's in Acts somewhere, is where you know Paul wanted to go somewhere. I think it was to Rome, and you know God was hinting through. Uh, I can't remember his name now. His brain's gone dead. He has daughters that were the prophetesses, and, and they prophesied, you know, don't go because you're going to be bound this way and that way. So don't go to Rome. And lo and behold, Paul went to Rome. So you have examples in the Bible where, although God makes it right in the end, people do their own kind of thing. Yeah, good point, Brother Bill, Brother Joe. Uh, just that, that uh, yeah, Bill uh, enlightened me there. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think Math Matthias was picked uh, out of their uh, enthusiasm to... Uh, to replace who God had chosen, and uh, and Christ uh, picked all of the apostles except Matthias, and so uh, I would say the twelve gates may be lacking his name, and, and Paul maybe have one. That's it. Um. Well, as I said, I'm not convinced that uh, this was God's will to pick Matthias, but Joe, well, one of you said, and this has often been cited that Matthias is never mentioned again. 
and and that's an argument to say that it was uh, he he was not the one that was supposed to be picked. It should be Paul, or that to, to to diminish him or eliminate him as a real apostle. But I believe now I may be proven wrong, but I, I I'm going to predict that from this point forward. Uh, now we just had all these different names of apostles that we went through this list and we we're counting them up how many there were. I, I I suspect from this point forward. From the, all the way into Revelation, where uh, there's going to be some of these apostles that are never mentioned again. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, that's my uh, re recollection. So the fact that some was not mentioned again, some of them are very prominent: uh, Peter and Paul, uh, John is mentioned a few times. Mostly, it's about Peter and Paul. James becomes uh, the brother of the Lord, becomes uh, distinguished in this, but uh, uh, the rest of them, uh, I don't, I don't think that they're mentioned uh, much at all, if, if at all. Um, so I, I wouldn't use that as a as a judgment against Matthias necessarily. Um, okay, I, I, anything else on that before we we offer our like a summary of this? No, I suppose only. You know, just to reiterate what I said earlier, I found where it was. It was the it was the prophet Agabus that 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 told Paul, you know, if you're going to go doing this, you know, when you get to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound, you know. So yeah, he kind of done his own little thing there, but God made it right in the end anyway. Agabus, A G A B U S, Agabus. That's an interesting name. All right, um, brother Joe, any thoughts on these last verses? Uh, just that uh, I've been enlightened a little bit, thought of things I never thought of before, and uh, uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, yeah, no, uh, very inter interesting stuff, though. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. Um, all right, I guess let's just get a, like an overview summary of, of uh, what we've covered today in this first chapter for, for each of you. Uh, and then if Brother Bill is inspired, we'll have him present the gospel when we're uh, after this summaries are finished. Uh, Brother Bill, what's your summary of the study today? Uh, my summary is very interesting. We're seeing the, the pre-birth of the church here and, and, and all the things that were going on. Uh, yeah, it's just really interesting. Sometimes it's good to get a bit of history and, and just to see what, you know, people saying and doing you know we've gleaned so far that you know there was a mad panic and they had to choose another apostle probably by their own hands and not by God we, we, we see obviously that the, the the two mysterious characters who was encouraging the apostles as the Lord went up there just just so much but you know all you know suffice to say it's really encouraging that's really good and, and you know we, we do hope and pray that people can glean something all right, thank you, and Brother Joe. Joe. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm just fascinated by the the history of it all. Uh, it's the birth of uh, of the church age, and uh, you know Luke is the one author of the Bible that even secular historians, as we found out from our last uh, study that I did with you, uh, even the secular historians hold Luke in highest regard. And so it, it's a it's a great history, and it starts off I think focusing on Peter, and it'll end up Folks about Paul, it's the transition from uh, the age of law to the age of grace in practical terms, and uh, in, a, in a history. In a history, I think it's fascinating. I'm, I'm really loving it and looking forward to continue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's very, very interesting. Uh, this chapter, um, it doesn't have a lot of really uh, like bombshells and really things that we're as we continue on that are going to get us really excited you know either one way or the other excited because it's oh it's so it's such a inspiration or, or oh this is a great controversy everybody's arguing about this how do you explain these this portion of scripture um, one of the things I forgot to say uh, in introducing the, the whole study is that um, there are a handful of books that are um, the, the books where the, the um, heresies are more likely to come out of. Uh, Lordship Salvation, 
baptismal regeneration. Uh, uh, you could lose your salvation. The, these 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 heresies. Are, um, if a person doesn't properly understand a hand, certain books, that's that's where the, the, the minefields are. I would say Matthew, uh, because people don't understand it. When Jesus says all, all these commands and it makes everything so strict. He's not saying that's is how you get saved. He's saying now you understand how impossible Judaism is for you. Uh, they don't if they if they read it with that in mind, they'd get Matthew. Uh, and then you've got the next problem is the book of Acts. Book of Acts we got baptismal regeneration and we got a repenting of your sins. That's the as the th main issues in this book I think that the errors people can conclude incorrectly. Uh, you've got James that people misunderstand and think that uh, you have to do works to get saved. And uh, you've got Hebrews. There's some few verses in Hebrews that, and then Revelations. Revelation, of course, is, I'm sorry, I apologize for calling it Revelations. <laughs> I bother me when I hear people put an S on the end of it. But um, the book of Revelation uh, has a lot of verses in there that people use Revelation to, uh, you know, like you're going to be blotted out. And so this is one of those books, the book of Acts. And that, that's why it's going to be very interesting as we go through this. I'm so happy that the three of us are doing it together. I hope Brother Ted will be able to join us um, as we go along. Uh, but there are, there are some bombshells coming up. And uh, it, that's why this book not only can be very revealing in terms of understanding the first 30 years of the church, what transpired, getting it right is very, very important. If you get it wrong, you can not only be a heretic, but fall into damnable heresy, which is the heresy that means you're not even saved. Um, all right, those are our uh, summary. I am really excited about going on with this study. Uh, we always save a few minutes in the end to present the gospel message, and I'm so happy Brother Bill's with me today, and uh, I, I give him the, the honor uh, of telling the audience the good news that salvation is a free gift. Brother Bill? Yep, yeah, thanks a lot for the honor, and it is actually an honor. That there's no greater privilege within Christendom than, than to give the gospel message, the, the good news. But quickly before I do, I have to just quickly say one thing, and that is, although Acts chapter 1 wasn't full of bombshells, that was certainly full of a lot of little gems. So I'm hoping and praying that, that people can glean those little gems that we, that we spoke on anyway. But anyway, I suppose the most important part and portion, as I always see of any hangout, and that is the gospel, which is the good news. But to be honest, I, I have to give the full counsel of God, and I have to give bad news, then some really bad news. And, and then I have to actually give you diabolical news. But, the, the, you know, the, the bad news is the word declares for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. You know, God expects this standard, and if we are really lucky, we can get to there. You know, if you're like me, you're, you're probably hopping around there. So that's bad news. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What's even worse than this it is the wages of this sin is death. That's separation from a loving God. And, and the diabolical news is there's nothing you can do about it. Absolutely nothing. That is to say there's nothing you can do about of yourselves and in yourselves. But thanks be to God. Although, you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin have been death. But the gift of God this day, you know, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And this gift is so simple. You know, religion, as always through history, tried to complicate it. You know, even before Christianity, you know, you have Judaism with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Always religionity has complicated salvation. The salvation is just, just by faith, just by, <clears throat> by believing on Jesus Christ and what he says and what he's done for you. You know, Jesus himself says, verily, verily, which means definitely, definitely, I say you, he that believeth on me hath, that's present tense, everlasting life. That's not even complicated, not even a bit, is it? There's no, you know, religious kind of somersaults needed there. 
<clears throat> it's just believing on this Jesus Christ. But we must be clear that you have to believe on the real Jesus Christ. Because we know, you know the word even says many false Christs have come out. There's many false Christs out there. But there is a particular Jesus Christ in whom the scriptures speak of completely. That, that he is the, the Christ that loves you so much this day. That he came down from his glory. You know, being manifest in flesh. And, and made payment through death and shed of his precious blood. You know, for every single creature on earth this day. The same Christ was buried. But thanks be to God, on the third day, he rose from the dead in resurrection power. You know, having defeated sin, death and hell itself. That is the real Jesus that we preach. That is the real Jesus of the Bible. And that is the real Jesus that would save every single creature out there, even at a whim. You know, just call upon him. You know, this is the, the good and glorious gospel truth that we're given today. And I have to, I do always love to, I might be a pain in the backside for, for keep, you know, repeating myself redundantly, but the, 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 the greatest scenario of this, this happening in, in real time, accurately, you know, within the scriptures, where, where a direct question is asked in regard to salvation, and a direct answer is given. And that is the example of the Philippine jailer. Now, you have to, Imagine a scenario, you know, the Apostle Paul and Silas, that they, they was in prison. They was bound in chains. And under Roman law in those days, if any prisoner escaped, you know, the prison guard, we know, was duty bound either to kill himself or would be executed. So that's, that's the background for the scenario. And there was a mighty earthquake, you know, where they was kept in, in the cell. And believe it or not, the chains and fetters, they fell off. You know, the, the, the apostle, they fell off all the prisoners in there, you know, and, and you know, the Philippine jailer, you know, drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he knew the consequences, you know, if they all escaped. And, and, but then, this is the beauty of it, you know, Paul says, you know, you know, I'm paraphrasing it, Paul says, don't kill yourself, don't kill yourself, don't do yourself no harm. And he says to them with that direct question, he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, the requirement, what must I do? This is a gentle, this isn't a Jew who knew the law and knew all the prophecies. This is just an average Joe on the street, as we call it today. And he asked, what must I do to be saved? And they said to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. How simple is that? That is, that is such good news. It's so simple. And, and you know, it, it brings joy to me just to even just express that and to let people know that salvation isn't about religiosity and do's and don'ts, you know, it isn't about, you know, even a sin issue. But what I'll tell you one thing for sure is it's a sun issue. He that have the sun have life. And, and, and this is what the gospel is. It is offering life to, to every creature out there today. You know, the word even goes further and says, you know, this is how good God is. For by grace are ye saved. And that's unmerited favour through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So you can't you can't earn this gift. You can't buy this gift. You can't work for this. It is free gracious to every creature out there this day. And all you need to do is believe on this Jesus Christ. This Jesus Christ that loves you so much that he died for all your sins. This is all your thoughts, you know, your shortcomings. Past present and future, who is buried and he rose again in resurrection power the third day. If you believe on this Christ this day, you will live. And know that this life is, is not just temporal, this is eternal. You know, this is this is such good news. It, it's almost embarrassing. You know, the word even says, and it's clear, you know, in the hope of eternal life, this is what God offers when you believe in, which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began so you have a cast iron guarantee when you believe on this jesus you have eternal life from that very second and we know that god is not going to lie about it. even in the old testament you know it's recorded you know it says that god is not a man that he should lie neither the son of man that he should repent or he changes his mind so if you know if you believe on christ this day the real christ of the bible you have an assurity and a guarantee you know, that, that 
eternal life it, it, it is what you're going to receive. And just I'll quickly bring this now because it has come to the forefront very often, you know, even within uh, circles within Christendom. And, and it's a lot of controversy, you know, who can be saved, who can't be saved. But the simple answer is all can be saved. The word of God even says, for the grace of God, this is unmerited favour, you know, that bring of salvation have appeared to all men, not some men, not an elect few or a select few, but all men. So I pray this day you would believe on this risen Christ, that you would believe that he is offering this free gift this day, and you would trust him. I put faith in him. Just believe him and take him at his word. So I pray you do that. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right. Thank you very much, Brother Bill. Uh, that's the good news. And I, I, All I would add to it is that when you are saved, it's past tense. It's it's settled. It could it could never be reversed. Salvation, once you put your faith in Jesus, is irreversible. It's irrevocable. You are guaranteed you're going to go to heaven because you put your faith in the great Savior, God Jesus. All right, brothers, thank you for participating. And uh, we'll, we'll just play it by ear each day. We'll get through this. and uh, probably take a long time to get through the whole book. But uh, I look forward to next time. Um, the viewers, uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.